Can I get his slides on there? Ah, awesome. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, morning. Uh, thanks for being here. Thanks for the organizers for running this event. Carlton, wherever you are, this was an amazing keynote. Thank you. Really inspiring. There you are. Um, and also the venue, give them a round of applause again, because this is just <laughs> fabulous. Right, so today, can you hear me in the back? Good. So today I want to talk to you about um, how we log information these days, how we store information or have information available when we run services in production, and yeah, how we how I think that we can prove upon that and how we can turn that into something where we can ma gain more information from what we currently do. And before I get into that, let me briefly introduce myself. I'm Mark Holterman. I'm a Django Core contributor. Even though I've not contributed to the core components for a couple of years now, I tend to be more on the security team and the Django Ops team these days. In my day job, I work at Crate.io, which is the company behind a database called CrateDB, which is for IoT sensor data um, that direction. So if you want to talk about that stuff, talk to me and find me. I'm here until the end of the sprints. So let me talk about logging and the problems we are facing today. We have applications that are run by or used by hundreds, thousands, maybe even millions of people. And Things are usually going smoothly and are usually fine until they aren't. And then you have problems and you have engineers who need to figure out what is happening there and what is going wrong. And well, one of the things they do is they look at log messages and they look at what actually happened there. And the log message that, that we have is what we currently, what's I guess currently common. And the current state of logging, I think, is okay, and I think there's a lot of good stuff happening there, but there's also a lot of stuff that we can improve and that we can make better. And when we log stuff these days, it's probably going to look, look a bit like this. We import the logging framework from Python standard library, we create a logger, and then we have this text of pros text of what's happening like in this example, login failed because uh, login failed because in connection to an authentication provider, something uh, timed out, and then we pass on the authentication provider. And when this message ends up in the log files somewhere or in log service, it's going to read like this. Like for somebody who has decent enough English, case, in English skills, they can make assumptions and have an understanding of what's happening, but it's up to them to actually understand what's happening at that time. And because we look at log messages after the fact, after something has happened, maybe hours later because we didn't realize it in time, it's really, really hard to actually figure out what went wrong and what happened. And in this particular case, for example, the person, the engineer who looks at this message and sees this one message, um, they can deduce that, well, somebody probably tried to log in using some maybe OAuth provider, in this case, maybe Google, probably Google, and something timed out because for whatever apparent reason, nobody has freaking clue at that, idea, at that point in time because there's no additional information about that. And yeah, this information already provides a lot of or this, this log message already provides a lot of context and information, but it's not actually really helpful, I think, because I think that at this point, our logging is broken. And our logging is broken because when I see this log message, there's a bunch of questions that I would like to ask where I'm just not going to get an answer on. What was the IP address of the host that this server that the log message was written on talked to? What was the, where did the, did the server try to connect you? Or what was the timeout limit? Was it five milliseconds, five minutes? Like five milliseconds for something external is probably far too short. Maybe it was a configuration mistake. Or how many other attempts were there that were made to talk to the provider? 
as in was it an isolated incident or was it something that like happened for hundreds of users simultaneously? And there are even more important questions, I think, like stuff like where were there outgoing connections, other outgoing connections affected as well, or was it just this connection to this one service, which, as an engineer, could give you additional information about um, if it's maybe on their side or is it something on your side? Is there some routing um, that's broken? And were other servers affected? Was it just this one server that failed, or was it like your whole fleet of servers? And I think this information we could actually add to those log messages. Like, you can have this message that says, authentication to, prov um, f to host whatever at point this failed with like time, uh, timeout m amount of whatever. And then you have a five kilometers long log message that nobody's able to comprehend because they have all the information that you co could possibly want in there. At which point, I think those pro-stall messages are just not going to cut it and are not going to help and are not really the thing we should be using these days anyway. And instead, I think we should look into something that's more structured. We should, should add structure to the log or to the log messages that we have these days. For example, look at this. Instead of using Python's uh, framework or logging library, we use a library called structlog, which is structured logging. And we create a logger similar to before, and then instead of having this long text, we have event. This event is a string, a short string, that provides the very necessary, the, the very specific meaning that this, that, that what, about what's happening. And then you attach annotations or additional information attributes to this event. All the information you have at that point that you could remotely rem or think that could be helpful. Like the provider name, the IP, the timeout, like whatever you can come up with when you lo write the log message. And at a later stage when you realize, oh, actually this value would have been helpful at all, start logging it as well. It's easy to just add another value there. And then in the log messages that you see on your laptop, it might look like this. It looks obviously different than this text that we had before. It still, still contains the time, the error level or log level. It contains the event and like all the attributes that you set before. In this case, also the server, because the way we configured struct log added the server automatically. And you can do, have do other things automatically add automatically. And now that we have some kind of structured data, we can actually think about reusing that in some slightly different way than it used to do before. So the, I guess the most commonly used structured format these days, in the modern world anyway, and like leaving XML out because that's kind of like the old thing, is probably JSON. So we can have this structured thing log it as a JSON object into a file or into some log service or whatnot. And then when we have structured data, we can reuse that and throw it into a database like Create, into a database like Elasticsearch, into a database like Mongo, or any of those that can deal with structured data but are not bound to necessary specific, uh, specific schemas. And then with that, we can do something far more helpful than what we have when we look at a million records or a million lines of log messages. We can visualize what happens in our systems. And when you think about that, what you see is what you understand. And thinking about this message that we had before, let's show this graph. Have a brief look at it. The green lines with the three spikes are the successful authentication provider communications, and the yellow ones are the ones that failed. Now, the log message that we saw before is about at this point. Now, can you guess what now happened? Or can you think about some of the questions that I asked earlier? Stuff like, was it an isolated incident? Well, you look at the graph, and you can say, nope, it's not, because obviously, for visually 
apparent reasons, there are more cases of that error message, of that, that log message, that event that failed, where something failed. And you can see that something one way or not the other way. And I think this is often far more helpful than scrolling through a million lines of log messages. And a picture says more than a thousand words. Because when we now correlate this graph with a different one, for example, this one, then as an engineer you might, who has understanding of the environment, you might have a better understanding of the entire setup and a, of have a, can have a good idea of what's happening on a larger scale. Now, these graphs show the total amount of log messages for a given log level. So the blue lines are the debug messages, green is info, and red is error. Now, the blue, lo blue ones kind of follow the pattern that we had for the green one uh, the, in the previous graph with three spikes, and that's fine. That is kind of like, I guess, what you expected. And then the green graph, which stays pretty much at the bottom, has a few small spikes, just like common info log message noise. Let's call it that. And that's fine. And then until the, the error messages on the kind of on the same level as the green one, because it's a, um, not the best uh, random data set I generated here, um, the red um, error mess or the error messages, the error message count, kind of briefly at inclined at 12 p.m. Now that can have all kinds of reasons because what you could when you think about the other graph, that error happened like about at this big spike. What could have happened here is that somebody started a st staged rollout and they deployed the application on the configuration change to a set of servers, a small set. And that set of servers raised a couple of errors, but possibly not enough that triggered the whole deployment to, to stop. And because it didn't stop that, it went to a second stage which you can see here. It's increased again, but maybe it's still not enough for the whole thing to fall over and to stop. So the deployment automation just went all ahead, deployed the code to everything, and well, there you are with like your whole application failing and nothing working anymore. Now this is something you can see. You look at this graph and you see something is wrong. And you don't need to scroll through your million lines of log messages. And this is knowledge an engineer can gain by looking at something without spending hours of time on figuring out what's happening. Especially when you have stuff like automation happen, having these visual insights in your software kind of provides a lot of valuable information, I think. And this is not really possible, I mean, to some degree, sure, but it's not really possible to do with like to the, the good old like, pro-style messages. Now, all the things we've talked about right now were like this, this system where you have your one application maybe running on multiple servers that does things. Now think about the micro or macro service infrastructure that you have. Like, think about the thousands of, or maybe not thousands, but dozens or hundreds of services that talk to each other. And this, this microservice framework, or make microservice architecture that you build because your boss th thought that uh, like microservices were a cool idea and it's like the best idea ever. Who of you think that the microservices they, or microservice or microservice architecture they have actually is like stable and they have services that when some, one service falls over, it doesn't like make the whole thing blow, away, blow up. Anybody? I see one hand up there in the back. Good on you, good on you. lucky you. Um, because I, th I think that um, a lot of the information that we currently have and that we currently do with logging is not giving us actually the information that we need in order to figure out why, why when one starts falls over, why it actually falls over. Because 
you have this one service that talks to another, that talks to another, that puts something in a queue, that's done, then worked on by some workers, that do then something else. If anything in this chain fails, how does the services dep that depend on that actually are able to deal with that? And I think a very big part of that is not being certain how the events that happen in our systems actually correlate to each other. So are you able to trace that this one thing a user did on, their, on your front end actually, are you able to figure out that this thing caused this thing to not work in the back end somewhere? Maybe because they entered some value, some weird email address with a whatever, a plus sign in the f before the ad, um, and all of a sudden your entire billing process dies because you have some broken error handling in there. Like if you, if the service dies and you don't have any tracing in there, it's you go, you're gonna have a very, very, very interesting time figuring this out. And so the the thing I'm, I'm I want to propose here is to do something called um, event tracing. So essentially, the very first time you see a request come to your system, you give it a unique ID. Python's UUID uh, for for example is just so it's quite sufficient for that. It's unique. It's pretty much globally unique. You attach it to this first the, to the request the first time it comes in, and then every single time you lock anything ever, you attach this trace ID to this lock. And because you have structured logging, you can just add this attribute. Um, and you can even go further because then you pass this trace ID on to the next service, on to the next, on to the next. You put it in the queue, the, your salary worker is going to figure this out, see, oh, there's a trace ID. I should probably attach that to all the log messages I write as well. And then when you see this one thing failing, you see trace ID, and then you can go and look at all the log messages that have this trace ID. And then you can see the whole flow of how your whole data flew through your entire architecture. And with that, you can actually understand why some service failed because somebody, something happened somewhere else. And, well, we are at DjangoCon, so I better show some code that's related to Django. Um, so we have the structural library, we have uh, the logging frame, uh, the structural logger, and this is a middleware for, that you just put as middleware in the first, first middleware in your, um, in your settings. And what it does, it attaches the trace ID to a request, to the request object, and it either takes the request ID from a header, X trace ID, or it generates a new one. So if a request comes in from the outside world and you do proper filtering on headers, and like all the security nonsense you, no, not nonsense, all the security things you actually want to do, um, then you, um, you can ascertain that, this log, that the trace ID is generated by you, by yourself, or that when you talk to the service um, from other services in your backend, then you can ascertain that this actually is one of your trace IDs. So it's either a new one or some uh, trace ID that comes from, because it's a request from one of your other services. You create a new um, logger here in, in um, in uh, the middleware, that's some um, structure internals. It's a threat local um, behavior, I guess. Um, and this one with this trace ID equals request trace ID here, you will ascertain that everything that happens within this request will have this, log, this trace ID attached to it. Every single log message ever until the request is terminated or the next request rather comes in, at which point it's going to have a new trace ID. And then similarly, you can put something after the um, authentication middleware, for example, and you bind the user ID on the logger. So everything from that point onwards will include the, currently, uh, the user ID of the currently logged in user. Or no trace ID at all, no user ID if um, the user is not authenticated. Now, we're in the EU. We have a whole bunch of interesting relations. And thinking about DrangoCon last year, there was this 
for that thing called GDPR. So um, logging data these days is actually pretty fun or actually pretty something you really want to think about what you do. For example, you never ever want to log secrets. Hello Facebook, hello GitHub, hello Twitter. Um, if you want to have your company's name next to that, please do that and like lock user's password or something. Um, I recommend you do, don't do that. It's bad practice, actually, as, uh, so I've heard. <laughs> um, also, you kind of don't want to accidentally expose all the logs that you lock to, your, to the outside world. Like stuff like S3 buckets are very, very good at being publicly readable or possibly even writable. It's a really great idea to have that. Um, similarly to something called MongoDB, um, which is like one of those, I don't know why, but when you read certain newsletters, this is like every week there's somebody else who had the publicly accessible MongoDB. Um, I mean, I never say never, but so far I've not had that. I think something fell over there. Um, and then, yeah, be explicit about what you log. I guess that's the more important part about the, um, the GDPR thing. Then do, uh, do the first one, like set explicit attributes that you want to have, that you want to lock to your log files and you have end up in your log system. Don't do the latter because you have no freaking idea what's actually on this object. Or it might not just work. Um, right, so with a bit less than 10 minutes left, who the heck is Frank Taylor Jr.? <laughs> um, let me answer that with a slightly different question. Who here knows the movie Catch Me If You Can? Okay, not everybody. Let me give you a brief answer. It's a, the main character is a person called Frank William Abagnale, and he figures out a bunch of cons, where he cons banks, airlines, airports, hotels, like all those like interesting companies and organizations where you can make money, or can save money, rather. And the problem is that nobody's actually really able to trace him until some point. And one of that uh, reason is that he, why he's n nobody's able to trace him is because he figured out how, or he was smart enough to, to cover his tracks, and he figured out how to like work around the US um, check routing system by forging checks and having them routed through the whole country. And the thing is that when you th take this like, example from the real world and apply to something, to some like, microservice architecture maybe, then if you are able to trace events across your entire system, you can actually figure out who did what and what happened and why. And I think the key here is that with proper logging and more smarter logging that we currently do in most cases, I think, um, we can gain far more information and can get uh, much, yeah, get much more intelligence about our users, about how our system is being used, about the resilience of our services. And yeah, this is, I think this, a lot of gain by going into a more structured logging approach. And at this point, I wanted to go with a like, more live demo, but didn't actually have time to finish that. So also, I'm freaking scared of live demos on stage, and I promised myself I'd never do that. So I quoted an example. There's a code on GitLab. If you want to run this thing, it's a Docker Compose setup. Um, we're essentially replace this, this um, catch me if you can thing a bit. You have an Nginx startup page, index page that you can visit there. Comes up with a, there's, a, there's two banks that you can uh, deposit money and wire checks and wire, tra wire money from one person to another. Um, there's an airline where you can book flights. Um, there's a Grafana dashboard where you can then see all the events that happen in the system with like how this wire transfer from one bank to another flew through the system or how this check that you used to pay for this flight ended up at this bank but because that's a local bank and then needed to go through the other side of the country and then like all those 
events, this event tracing kind of be a bit mocked and like, like abstracted here. And then you can also go and like look at the raw database here and like all the log, raw log events and um, yeah, have a look and see or play around and like, yeah. That's the example. Um, now I forgot what I wanted to do. I actually wanted to make this repository public. Um, <laughs> I can do that right after the talk um, or while you prepare for your question. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, do we have any questions? Again, please line up at the microphone. Hello, Marcus. Um, thanks for the interesting talk. Um, in a typical stack, we not only have our Django application, but also Nginx, MicroWSG, Postgres. How would we go about sharing or correlating the logs, not only the trace IDs, but the time stamps, the way of having the same name for the same fields all over? Are you aware of any standards or initiatives to have a consistent naming scheme for uh, structured logs? or? I think it de highly depends on how actually you build your microservice architecture. Is it like one team or maybe a few, very few teams that build the whole thing of 20 services? Or is it like 50 individual teams that each have their own thing that, where they publish an API and that's about it, the, about the communication between them? In the former um, sense, you can probably go and like set some standards. This is what we call these fields, or this is a best practice on how, how fields are called. Um, for example, always include an underscore ID if, if it's the ID of an object. And um, yeah, if it's the individual teams, I think it's much harder to, I mean, you should st still enforce certain things there, but um, also if you have individual teams, you don't want to take too much of the um, uh, independency of, um, away from them. So this is, I guess it depends a bit on the particular case there um, of your organization. Hey, it sounds, and I guess at the whole internet community level, nothing exists that yeah. you're aware of. Yeah. Okay. Um, to expand a little bit on the previous question, uh, JSON and structured logging is like a little bit going in both directions. Because if you're saving JSON into a database, what kind of structure do you have? How can you still search in it with a while being um, performant? I mean, you said you don't want to impose too many rules. But on the other hand, if you have like um, 200 different log messages with different fields, how are you going to search in them? How are you going to find anything again? Um, so the, the JSON output is more a thing to have a structured way to write it some way in a, in a log file or something that's then being picked up by a f whatever FluentD or, or a FileB or something and thrown into a more or less schema -less database or a database that can handle dynamic schemas. Um, as I said, it's, I think it's uh, highly dependent on, on the application, on, on the environment where you build in with your system. You probably want to have some enforcements um, at, at, the, at some point anyway. But um, I think there's also just a bunch of best practices that just exist. That um, like you, things like um, you call if it you, you call it what it is, not what you think it should be. Like if it's if it's an ID, call it an ID. If it's milliseconds, call it milliseconds, not something arbitrary. Like um, I guess it's if you think about it from a. When you look at the more ops perspective, like Prometheus in that direction, they have a couple of best practices on their, um, on their page how to name metrics, like include a base unit, for example. Um, this is probably something that a good recommendation that you can do, but yeah, it depends on, I guess, highly depends on the organization. Hi, Marcus. That was a very interesting talk. Uh, it's a, a bit of a continuation to the previous question. Uh, a lot of places where, where we use more than one server in parallel, 
even if it's not uh, microservices, you use some sort of logging service. A lot of those are using the ELK uh, stack. And um, I was wondering if, if Structlog has any integration with that that can make it um, be easier to use. So Structlog, Structlog more, plays more of the role of a, let's call it a replacement for the st Python standard library. And then you log it to a file and have Fallbeat or whatever does uh, Fluent D and throw that in whatever data store you have. That's, um, you wouldn't do that within the request, for example. You wouldn't handle like this right into a data store as well in the, in the request. It would just take too long. Do we have any questions from the internet, Russell? Okay. Yeah. Then right. that's it. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we will now have a break until 11.15.